Two B frequency distributions and their graphs. So previously we talked about qualitative data and created a frequency distribution for that and did some graphs related to that, some bar graphs and pie chart. Now we're going to talk about quantitative data. Quantitative data is that numerical data, and we're going to create a frequency distribution for that, and then we're going to get into doing some graphs that are specific to quantitative data. So. First thing we need if we're going to do a frequency distribution is we need some numerical data. So let's find some. So I survey some people and ask them their ages. And I get 27, 42, 19, 56, 39, 31, 49, 24, 62, 38, 41. So now I have some data, and we're going to create, create a frequency distribution from this data. Now, frequency distributions for numerical data don't have categories, they have classes. So instead of having categories like we had, you know, like if we were dealing with hair color, brown, black, blue, whatever, we're going to have classes which are a range of numbers. So we're going to have to come up with how do we determine what our classes are going to be. But if we're going to do that, we need to know how many classes we need. And in the real world, you would usually have between 5 and 20 classes, depending on how many data points you have, the range of the data values, and what resolution or definition you want to be able to have. For the purposes of learning, we really only need about 3 to 5 classes. That's enough to show the methods and to work through it and saves us just having to plug in a bunch more numbers. So you will always have the number of classes defined for you, in this course at least, and therefore I am going to say let's do this with four classes. In the real world, you would obviously select how many classes you're going to have. But for the purposes of coursework, we're going to have four classes. So one of the first things I'm going to do with this is I'm going to find out how many data points I have. How many people were sampled? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So n is equal to 11. Remember that lowercase n stands for sample size. So we have a sample size of 11. I'm going to go and I'm going to find the range. The range is the maximum value minus the minimum value. So the highest value minus the lowest value. So we've got a 42, a 56, a 62. Looks like a 62 is the maximum value. And the minimum value, I see a 19. Anything lower than that? 19. 62 minus 19 is 43. So we have a range of 43. Now remember, I said we need to find out these classes, well, doing that, we're going to determine the class width. The class width, how big are each of these classes, is found by taking the range and dividing it by the number of classes. In this case, the range is 43. The number of classes is 4. Do not confuse it with the sample size. There are 4 classes. 4. 43 divided by 4 is 10.75. Now pay attention to this next statement because I have spent years perfecting the wording on this. When calculating the class width, we always move up to the next highest whole number. We always move up 
to the next highest whole number. So since we have 10.75, we're going to move up to 11. Now be careful. I didn't say that we round up. I said we always move up. So if that was 10.25, we would still move up to 11. If it was 10.01, we would move up to 11. If it was exactly 10, we would move up to 11 because we always move up to the next highest whole number. So if you get a whole number as the result, you still move up to the next highest whole number. So whatever we get here is going to turn into a whole number. So if it starts as a decimal, it's going to turn out to be a whole number. If it starts as a whole number, it's going to be a whole number, but it's going to move up. So we have a class width of 11. So now we can start building these classes. When building our classes, we always start with the minimum value. In this case, that was 19. That's the lower end of the first class. The lower value of any class is called the lower class limit. So this 19 is the lower class limit. The upper value is the upper class limit. Now the class width is defined as the difference between consecutive lower class limits. Meaning that if I were to take this lower class limit and subtract this one from it, I would get the class width. So if I take my lower class limit and I add the class width to it, then I get the next lower class limit. So 19 plus 11 is 30. Now, since this is 30, then the upper class limit must be 29. We subtract 1 from it. If this is 30, then the next lower class limit would be 30 plus 11, or 41. The next would be 41 plus 11, or 52. So now I have my lower class limits. 41 minus 1 is 40. 52 minus 1 is 51. And you may notice that 30 minus 19 is 11. 41 minus 10 and 30 is 11, right? That's how we designed it. But also 40 minus 29 is 11. 51 minus 40 is 11. So not only do our lower class limits move by the class width, but so do the upper class limits. So this one here, 51 plus 11 is 62. Now please note with this that these classes are all the same size. Okay? And we don't have one that goes from 19 to 29, next one goes from 30 to 46, next one goes from 47 to 49, right? They're always the same size. And a little rule of thumb or sanity check that you can do when dealing with this is look at the limits, the lower class limits, look at the upper class limits, and there are a few things that could happen. Either they're all going to be odd, or they're all going to be even, or they're going to alternate odd, even, odd, even, odd, even, or even, odd, even, odd, even, odd. So in this case we have odd, even, odd, even odd even, odd even. So they alternate odd even, so it makes sense, it's believable. If we make a common mistake, which is 41 plus 11 is 52, 52 plus 11 is 63, and we put that 63 here, then we have odd, even, odd, odd. That doesn't follow a pattern that we would expect for it. We must have made a mistake and go, oh yeah, that 53 should have been here, minus one, sorry, 63 should have been here, Minus 1 makes it 62. So be careful about that and use that to your advantage, knowing that that's what's going to happen. Now, just like we had in our qualitative data, we're trying to find the frequencies, and we could use a tally column. I'm not going to, in this case, I'm just going to go straight to frequency, and I'm just going to put an F there for it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and look at these data values and see how many I have between 19 and 29. So I've got one, two, 
three. I have three between 19 and 29. How many between 30 and 40? 30 and 40, I have one, two, three. So I have three between 30 and 40. How many between 41 and 51? One, two, three. Looks like I have three between 41 and 51. This is a pretty evenly spaced distribution. And then between 52 and 62, I have one, two. So I have two. So this is my frequency distribution. Now remember, you should always do that sanity check, add up your frequency column, three, six, nine, 11, and make sure that that value is equal to the sample size. I started with 11 data values, I have 11 in my frequency distribution. So that right there, that's our frequency distribution. Now, just as we did with qualitative data, we can continue on and get some more information. I'm going to switch to a different color just because we're now no longer creating the frequency distribution, we're finding a different, different information from it. So we're going to go to the relative frequency. Remember, relative frequency, so rel f. Relative frequencies, remember, is the frequency divided by the sample size, so I have three elevenths, three elevenths, three elevenths, kind of boring with all those threes there, and two elevenths, which adds up to 11 elevenths, or one. Now, it's perfectly fine to leave those as fractions as long as we simplify the fractions. These are in simplest form, so it's okay to leave it like that. But we also know that sometimes it's easier to work with decimals than with fractions. So I can convert them to decimals. So 3 elevenths is 0 0.27. 0 0.27. 0 0.27. And 2 elevenths is 0 0.18. So now I have those, and again, we want to add those up and make sure that they come out to be 1. So we get 0 0.27, 0 0.54, 0 0.71, 0 0.99. Sorry, I said that one. That was 0 0.27, 0 0.54, 0 0.81, 0 0.99. So 0 0.99, and we see that that's not exactly one, but it's really close to it, and I trust it because we see that we rounded all of those numbers. This, the next number was a two, so it rounded this to the seven. The next number was a two, the next number was a two, the next number was a one. So all of these ended up getting rounded down by one or two thousandths, which put me off by about one hundredth. So that's okay. So we checked our relative frequencies. Another thing that we do is we find cumulative frequencies. Cumulative frequencies to accumulate if I ask you what it means to accumulate wealth, you're like, well, that's to gain wealth, right? Accumulating is adding to. So cumulative frequency is basically adding up the frequencies. You're counting how many you have at a certain point and you keep adding to it. So I have a cumulative frequency. In our first, our first class, we had a frequency of three, so we have accumulated three data values at this point. Our second class, we have another three, so three plus three is six. We have a total of six. The next class adds another three, six plus three is nine. And then the next class adds two more, nine plus two is 11. So those are our cumulative frequencies. How many data points have we accumulated by the time we get done with that class? And also note, 
Another sanity check that the cumulative frequency of your final class should match your sample size, the number of data values that you have. And we don't add up the cumulative frequency column because that really wouldn't tell us anything. So there's our cumulative frequencies. Now there's a couple more things that we're gonna need and these are more helpers than anything else. They're gonna help us be able to graph this. So one of these that we're gonna do is the midpoint. The midpoint is just what it sounds like. It is the middle point of that class. Meaning, I look over here and this class goes from 19 to 29. It's going to be the middle of that class. And how do we find that middle of the class? We average the two class limits. So we go 19 plus 29, which gives us 48. So 19 plus 29 is 48. And then we divide by the number of things that we're adding. So we divide by 2. 48 divided by 2 is 24. So I'm going to write this down. We've got 19 plus 29 divided by 2 is equal to 48 divided by 2 is equal to 24. Just so we have that written down. There. So 19 plus 29 divided by 2, so 48 divided by 2 is equal to 24. And be careful of order of operations. This is one of those very common places for people to make mistakes because they plug it into their calculator as 19 plus 29 divided by 2. That is, they plug it in like this. 19 plus 29 divided by 2. And order of operations says divide before you add. So they have 29 divided by 2 gives them 14.5, and then it gets added to 19, gives them 33.5, which is not the midpoint. 33.5 is not even in that class. So we have to be careful and make sure that if we're doing it all in one piece, that we put parentheses in there so it adds first, and then we divide by 2. So we want to be very careful about that. Very common mistake. Sanity check on that is look at and say, okay, the midpoint that I got, and check it for all of them, it's somewhere near what would be the middle of my class. 33.5, that's not even in my class. Obviously, it can't be the middle point of my class. 24, well, that makes sense. Yeah, that's kind of in the middle there. So 24. So I can do the same thing for my second class to find the midpoint. 30 plus 40 is 70, divided by 2 is 35. 41 plus 51 is 92, 92 divided by 2 is 46. Now you may notice here too, 35 minus 24 is 11 the class width. 46 minus 35 is 11, the class width. So not only do the up lower limits and the upper limits move by the class width, but so do the midpoints. But that makes sense because if the two numbers you're averaging are moving by the same amount, shouldn't their average move by the same amount? Yes, it should. So I can easily say, well, that was 24 plus 11 is 35 plus 11 is 46 plus 11 is 57. And if you go 52 plus 62, you're getting 114. 114 divided by 2 is 57. So those are our midpoints. And again, like I said, that's going to be a helper to us in creating our graphs. But there's one more thing I want to do that's going to be a helper when we're creating graphs, and that is finding our class boundaries. Class boundaries. We have class limits, but notice that there's space between this 29 and 30. There's space between the 40 and 41. The classes, I mean, numbers are continuous, so the classes really touch one another. And to do that, we create class boundaries. 
You can kind of think of this like property lines and property, property values, right? You have ownership up to a certain point and then your neighbor has ownership from there. But the class limits are kind of like, we call them setbacks. You're not allowed to build anything on your property within a certain distance of the property line and that's called a setback. You're not, you have to stay with, you know, back by 15 feet or whatever the case may be for your town or jurisdiction. So those setbacks block us. And you can think of our class limits as having those setbacks in place so that they don't touch each other. There's a buffer between the two neighboring classes. But the boundary is where the classes touch. And just like it would be if we were doing properties the setbacks are equal on either side of the line. So we're going to take the average of 29 and 30, which is 29.5. Basically, we're going to add 0.5 to 29, and we're going to subtract 0.5 from 30, giving us 29 either way. So 29 plus 0.5 is 29.5. 30 minus 0.5 is 29.5. So notice they're 0.5 away from the boundary, and they share the same boundary. 40 plus 0.5, 40.5, which obviously is going to make the lower boundary of this one 40.5, 51.5, 51.5, 62.5. Right. So you notice that our upper class boundaries are just 0.5 above the upper class limits, 29.5, 40.5, 51.5, 62.5. .5. The lower class boundaries are 0.5 below, 30 becomes 29.5, 41 becomes 40.5, 52 becomes 51.5, so 19 becomes 18.5. So for the lower class boundaries, we subtract 0.5 from the lower class limit, for the upper class boundaries, we add 0.5 to the upper class limit. So now we have not only the frequency distribution in place, but we also have our relative frequencies, our cumulative frequencies, we have midpoints, which are going to help us with graphing, and we have our class boundaries, which are going to help us with graphing.